hear people talking about RTI, maybe I'm rather wrong. Once we have a lawyer, his uncle here, maybe he will give us a brief orientation about RTI. Um, information bill. When you go to Article 21, Clause 1F, it is there clearly that we all have right to information, which Article 1, Clause 2 states that it is the law of the land. Anything found in contrary with this constitution shall to an extent be null and void. So clearly, the constitution has already spelled out our way out to have information. Now, if we are to say that people have embezzled funds, here day in and day out, we keep hearing this. And Article 88, Clause 3, has given the Attorney General, <laughs> the Attorney General, the right to prosecute people who embezzle funds because it borders on criminality. Okay. So if we have this and we tend to punish somebody who has stolen about 50 cities or 100 cities, mm. then Article 17 Clause 1, which talks about equality before the law, should be deleted from our constitution. Okay. If I'm getting it Thank wrong. you very much. And this is what I have. So Thank the, you very the much. final one is. <laughs> Thank you. So that was a comment. Final one. Okay. Final one. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. My name is Elias Apreko. My name is Elias Apreko from Delta Capital. My question goes to the Deputy Finance Minister. Uh, my question is about the non-bank financial institutions, especially the asset management companies. Now, a lot of them are, have gone down and some are still in the process of going down. Now, investors' monies are locked up. Their regulatory body is a SEC. It seems to me that SEC is not doing, doing much for the in, in investors. Yeah. Now, if you take the case of the banks, they are regulated by B, 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 BOG. And now they are getting a lot of attention and then support from, from the Bank of Ghana and then government. Mm. Now, if you go to the asset management firms, people's monies have locked up. Mm. And there is no hope of them getting their monies back. They go to SEC each now and then, and it's like there is there is no help or right. what so so you know ever for them. So what is government doing Fantastic. about you know, such? Thank noise. you for all your questions. I want to okay. apologize for the other people. Uh, we had actually planned that this program would close by twelve, so already forty five minutes beyond. And let me announce that if your questions don't get answered, we have another event on August thirty. And that event is we are discussing the corporate governance issues. It's called Behind the Corporate Curtain, the Hidden Face of Corporate Governance. And at least the two people on the right, Ace and Clara, I will force them to come. So we will have more on this. That's what I'm saying. It's an event we are doing at Alisa on August 30. So we will give you the chance to ask questions around the corporate governance issues. So what I'm going to do is, Charles, you have the last word. I'll take two minutes from the economists who haven't spoken in a long time. And then Charles will wrap up with your final answer. So first, Dr. Ebenezer. Two minutes, and um, Dr. ICB, two minutes, and then Charles ends it. That wraps it. Oh, we have the final. No, you have nothing. <laughs> Everything is finished. So just two minutes. Please start now. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, since it's wrapping up, I will take the opportunity to thank the organizers of this event. Uh, it's been quite successful and worthwhile. And subsequent ones would also uh, bring out the best. I will be able to brainstorm as people to find solutions to the problems saddling our economy. Mm -hmm. I want to touch briefly on uh, some figures. I think the Deputy Finance Minister mentioned that some of the financial institutions are in a way playing some financial chess game in this uh, subsector. That is uh, perhaps opening the mainstream bank and then having the savings and loans on the, on the side, but not focusing more on bringing in the unbanked population. Statistically, we have about 2.5 billion unbanked population in developing economies, including Ghana. You know, and this is what we should be looking at to bring in, not necessarily uh, perhaps establishing the firms and then uh, finding a nice way of uh, taking funds from the central bank and not going uh, putting it back for the purposes intended. And also there was a, there was a question, uh, a statement, there was an explanation which ended with a question from the panel, uh, from my brother is uh, whether the KPMG report uh, 
should not or could not be published. Uh, there was a question on this earlier by a radio station in the Ashanti region. Uh, the truth is that if you've accessed the report, you realize KPMG has uh, uh, made a statement. Usually, when there's an external audit, uh, one of five opinions is expressed. We have done qualified opinion, done qualified opinion with explanation, qualified opinion, adverse opinion, and no opinion. When one of these is expressed by the external auditor, then you can go ahead and we make the report public. But either of these has yet been expressed by KPMG, mm -hmm. and therefore it could be used for internal uh, purposes, but not fit for public consumption. And on the basis of this, the Bank of Ghana cannot release it into the public domain. That okay. is one thing we have to Thank uh, you for take the explanation. Note of. Okay, and also those who are asking for the prosecution, uh, actually we cannot rush as a nation into this. I'm happy Ace mentioned it. You see, Ace talked about prosecute, prosecute, prosecute. But he concluded with a caveat that it may not be as easy uh, as, it, as it seems and mm -hmm. that you have to tread cautiously. So right. they then end up uh, prosecuting someone, the person ending up prosecuting you rather Fantastic. Yes, for false prosecution. Mm -hmm. So you have to tread uh, cautiously. Thank you very and much. And one of three uh, prosecutions may occur. There may be administrative prosecution, mm -hmm. there may be civil prosecution and criminal prosecution. What it means is the current situation does not categorically fall under criminal prosecution. Some mm. may be administrative errors. Some may be civil and others may be criminal. All so right, we thank you very much. expect the same prosecution across board. Thank you very much. Sorry I'm harassing you, but I want to go off and there's time to it. So, Doc, thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Yes, um, I mean, I don't think uh, there's no doubt that uh, there have been some supervisory and regulatory lapses as far as the a banking situation is concerned. And the question that I begin to ask myself is that is the central bank biting too much that it can chew? Um, if you look at the entire banking system, as somebody said, I mean, right down from the lower end to the upper end, there is a problem. The microfinance institutions, we have about four to 500 microfinance institutions. We have credit union, about 400 also of them. We have savings and loan, so much of them. Now, the supervisory role of the central bank, does it have enough capacity to supervise all these tiers, about four tiers of bank, more effectively at the regional, rural, district levels? I think that is the one critical question that we have to ask. And I think that the time has come that the central bank sees some of these responsibility to a different body mm. who will directly you know supervise particularly the non-bank financial institutions so that the central bank focus more on the mainstream banks and do proper supervision in some other jurisdiction that role has been decoupled the role the supervisory role and the conduct of monetary policy the central bank focuses more on the conduct of monetary policy and macroeconomic management and have ceded the supervisory role to another institution with the capacity and the resources to do much more effective supervision because many of these problems could have been nipped in the bud. It could have, the central bank could have been more uh, uh, proactive other than being reactive in many of the cases, and we wouldn't have come up to, the, 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 to this stage if we have good supervision at the district, at the regional, and at the national level. Thank you. Thank you. Final comments from the Deputy Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, after I finished speaking, I um, got a text from a friend of mine who is in the audience. I don't know where he is hiding, but he said my political career is going to be short-lived because I'm too blunt. I didn't think I was being too blunt, but, you know, anyways. Um, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I think that we need to understand the implications of what is going on. When we got into power, we had we inherited an economy where we had interest rates in, I think the um, um, monetary policy rate was 24.5, thereabouts, and brought that down to 17. Inflation, we brought down to 10 or less than 10. Um, and, but we haven't seen that translate into 
lower interest rates within the banking sector. And that's something that really confused the challenge us because, you know, we thought we'll see the same type of, you know, uh, uh, downward trending rates because we can't grow this economy if the private sector is not working. And the private sector will only work if we can access credit. You see, and as one of the economists mentioned, you'd see that credit growth had really declined. So it was quite befuddling. And then you look at it closely and you look at it closely and you realize that the banks and the savings and loans and other institutions could not afford to bring their rates down because they were sitting on a lot of toxic assets. And they, because they had used some of this magical uh, uh, equity to set up these banks, they needed to pay more and more for deposits to cover up the big holes in their balance sheets. So even though we were doing all the right things at a macro level, it wasn't translating into lower interest rates at the, at the, at the micro level. So this cleanup is necessary because we have to sort of almost recalibrate clean everything out and come and start again. And that's the only way that we can get the private sector rejuvenated and banks starting to lend at rates that make it competitive for people to go out and start businesses and create the jobs that we so sorely need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of confidence, and somebody mentioned, talked about trust and confidence and how this has really disturbed trust. We really need to understand that, you know, it's only the institutions that had bad practices that are have been shut down. And it is quite easy. There was a uh, social media thing about, about how you can assess or determine if um, a bank or an institution is somewhere where you should put your money. There are some very simple telltale signs that you can look at. And I think as citizens, you know, the, the sophisticated investor, he, he made his decision because he knew, he knew what he was doing and he paid for it. But just the innocent depositor out there who went and put his money somewhere because uh, he believed in Bank of Ghana who had issued a license, those are the people that we should care about. And those are the people that we should encourage to stop looking at just high interest rates as the attraction, but look more at the soundness of the, the bank that they are putting their money in or the savings and loans institution and how they conduct business. Because mm -hmm. these guys are going to be custodians of their money and they have to be sure that they know exactly what they are doing. You know, and so that's important. That comes down to the corporate governance issue. We need to now, I think, insist that we have training programs to make board members understand the kind of responsibilities they are taking on as a board member. I mean, too much, too often, Ace wrote something about that. People feel like it's a prestigious thing to be appointed a board member. But if they told you that, look, this board you are going to sit on, if something happens, you're going to be liable for $5 million, you sit up, you think twice about it before you go and sit there. You know, so we need also to get mm. professional dignity or liability insurance. Elsewhere in the world, if you're an architect, you are uh, we're a structural engineer, and you go and do a design for a building, you have professional liability insurance. That if that building collapses, they'll come after you. And insurance will have to pay to compensate for everybody who passed, died or whatever was injured in that building. So that's something that is key. I think we also need to insist on a rating agency. We need to have a list of banks in good standing. At any time, the bank should be rated differently. The good ones who are more conservative and safe should have an A rating. Those who will take more risk have a C rating. So you can make an informed decision. If you're going to put your money here, you know what you're doing. And that should be separate from the regulator. This rating agency should be an independent body that evaluates and rates these. Are. It's done everywhere else in the world. I'm surprised it's not done here. We really need that so that people can now start having a way to benchmark and compare performance to know who to save with and who not to save with. I think it's really something that we have to insist on. The asset management business, that's another situation which I sit on the board of the SEC and they are going to come out with some new rules and regulations very shortly because that business is also one that has become totally a mess because the regulation and regulatory oversight has not been um, 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 stringent enough. And so therefore, we need to figure out ways to really tighten it up and make sure that the reporting requirements are as stringent as the Bank of Ghana requires. I also agree that the Bank of Ghana itself may be stretched a little too thin. You know, they have all these, I mean, I think that I was asking the other day how many MFIs they are. They were like 500 and something microfinance institutions. 500 and something. How do you supervise and monitor so many institutions with just the Bank of Ghana staff? I mean, how many of these can you visit? it every quarter. You know, how, I mean, so, you know, you, 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 you're, you're just going to sit there and wait for them to send their reports into you. There's no way you can go out and monitor them. Mm. So either we need to find ways to 
limit the number of these licensed institutions or, or have a ratio of capacity in terms of oversight capacity vis-a-vis -vis the number of these institutions that we have. I mean, I was thinking the other day that even with the banks, you know, what determines, as my minister was saying, the number of banks that we have? What should be the total capitalization of the number of banks? Shouldn't that be in relation to the total amount of financing requirements we need in such a country? How big are some of these projects, 200, 300 million projects, you want to build a port? You know, can the banks finance it together? And how does that, what's the relationship with that to GDP growth and GDP in total? So we need to have some metrics that then guide the number right. of these institutions that we have and how, how they are monitored and managed. Thank you very Thank you. much. Please put your hands together for the panel. So um, we got a lot of comments. I will just read one, just to be fair to the listeners. This one is from Femi. She said, he says, I think it's a he, Femi. He says, um, Bernard, I can say that Ghana has some of the best systems in place. However, what is the use of a system if the culture of respect that makes exceptions to norms and systems for certain? This well-meant but misplaced respect of persons regarding systems and laws in Ghana is our undoing. You know I'm from Nigeria, and we once had our banking crisis, which is not fully over. But the way forward is a moral will to place system and law above personalities. This is from Femi Abi. Dr. Benizar Ashley, financial analyst, Prof. Dr. Eric Osesibe, economist, Clara Kasati, corporate uh, lawyer and law lecturer, Ace Ankuma, a lawyer, and Charles Edubahin, Deputy Minister for Finance. Big thank you to Ken Ufriata, the Minister for Speaking, Vivian Kailoko for MC in the first part, and Kingsley and the team from Dankwa Institute for putting this together. I want to say goodbye to our listeners on Radio 97.3 CTFM and also for CTTV. Thank you for being part of the program. Good afternoon.